first of all, I'm going to take a couple of minutes just to tell you that what you see on paper about me is not what you're getting, okay? That's stuff I've done, um, but I would like for you to know just how I ended up here this morning. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm and quickly figured out that going to law school was a lot less work than milking cows, okay? Therefore, my, my cows are beef cattle and not dairy cattle. And part of my jurisdiction then, once I went on the bench, was juvenile court jurisdiction. And I spent a lot of time really sweating worrying about what was happening to these kids who are being abused and neglected. I tried cases where kids were beaten with hangers, where they had a little girl um, had unbelievable sexual assaults on her body. I, I was living and breathing as part of my jurisdiction at the county court level. How do I find guardian ad litems to care for these children because I know they have potential. If we can get them to adulthood, they might be contributing members of our community. I was trying to find foster parents. I was trying to find adoptive parents so they could have a sense of permanency. And when I went to the Indiana Court of Appeals, I saw what I had seen at a county level, I saw it 91 more times because we have 92 counties in Indiana, and I saw it from across the state. I didn't think a lot about animal law at the time, but I was luckily recruited to go to Purdue and uh, spend time at Purdue in the College of Ag uh, for two years. I was a department head that had the responsibility of the 4-H program. But then I had the opportunity to go to the National Institutes of Health, you're thinking, what? <laughs> what is this lawyer doing at our treasured National Institutes of Health? But I was fortunate enough that Dr. T.K. Lee uh, asked me to be his special assistant at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And my job was to look at the legal issues and research. And I'd been there about a week, and he walked in and wanted to know what do you think about using rats and mice in research? And I said, well, it's a higher and better use than me using them for target practice in the corn crib. <laughs> you know, what do I know? At which point he said, well, this is your part of your portfolio. And he handed me a file on all of the animal rights groups' opposition to the use of animals in research to improve the health of animals and humans. And I'm reeling from this, and I'm reading this surgeon from California who testified before Congress that he would rather his child die than a single animal be sacrificed in research. And, you know, I know California is unusual in the way they approach things, but to me that was just beyond belief. And so I became really immersed in thinking about the use of animals, what is a reasonable way for us to deal with animals, and here, therefore, I'm here. I'm still working with NIAAA. My uh, work at the School of Medicine is funded by NIAAA on the legal issues in research, and certainly that includes the use of animals. So thank you for letting me take you down that twisted path to this uh, podium this morning. What should you expect with the animal rights activists? Well, here are the short and easy answers. And man, this is as easy as you're going to find it. Um, they're passionate. Reason has nothing to do with what they want. They're very emotional. Um, we have a guy every Friday who spends the entire Friday when he should be studying at the Purdue Student Union railing against the use of animals in research, um, never mind the fact that Purdue School of Veterinary Medicine and the College of Ag's Department of Animal Science actually try to better the health of animals. They don't understand the law much. 
They have even less understanding of constitutional rights, and they have absolutely no respect for boundaries. And so my short answer and easy response is, well, we need to respect the rights of everyone. And we need to plan, we need to communicate, and we need to plan all over again. Who might show up? You all know these people. And there's about 30 to 70 more that are pretty active across the country in different pockets. They are opposed to the concept of ownership of animals. Why are they opposed to the concept of ownership of animals? I would suggest they see that as a permanent fundraising effort. Um, it is easy to go out and beg people to give you money for the benefit of animals. People don't say, why don't those animals get a job? Why don't those animals quit using drugs? If you try to get help for kids, the response is, why don't those parents take care of them? Well, with the animals, it's an easier fundraising. What is the law? And we're going to circle back to that question. Where are they going to show up? My response is, if you've got animals, you may be visited by, visited by an activist. Um, on the farm, at the fair, wherever animals are. And if you think I'm exaggerating, um, you see that livestock holler? Well, in DeKalb County, Indiana on November 2nd, the Butler Town Police stopped, not this rig, don't get me wrong, but they stopped a guy hauling carried dairy cull calves that he had purchased at the Shipshawana auction an hour and 15 minutes before he was stopped for an expired plate, expired trailer plate. Those of you who got multiple trailers, you'll understand. I, I did this last year. I put my livestock hauler sticker on my flatbed hay trailer and then vice versa. I was illegal all year long. Well, I didn't even know it till this year when we went to put the new stickers on. Uh, but that's the point is you can have legitimate errors that maybe you should pay a fine or an infraction, you should pay cost. But this guy is hauling through the town of Butler in Indiana with an expired plate on his trailer. Butler Town Police stop him. He has a speech impediment. So they hauled him out of the cab and uh, field tested him, uh, had him blow into a portable breath test instrument. He tested zero, 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 and had a drop to drink. He actually has nerve impairment, and he's 71 years old. And the cops said, well, why do you talk funny if you aren't drunk? He said, I don't know. This is the way I always talk. They thought that was disrespectful. They called the DeKalb County Humane Society because they were going to impound his uh, truck and trailer. He begged them not to. He said his brother, who has similar equipment, could be there legally within the hour and pick up these call cabs. But police didn't listen, and the DeKalb County Humane Society came, unloaded that trailer alongside Highway 9. No corrals, pens, nothing, just the berm of the road, two lane nine in Indiana, if you know it and let off the calves with leashes. They didn't have any halters for them either. And they were sure the calves were starving, so they brought store-bought milk to feed them, cold store-bought milk to feed these two- and three-day-old calves. He doesn't have his calves back yet. He's getting ready to file. So the point is file a notice of tort claims. But the point is the DeKalb County Humane Society took those animals, won't tell him where they are, won't give them back, and they did it with the authority of the uh, Butler police. So wherever you are, the activists can come, and you're not safe on the roads if you think you are. So what can you expect from activists? You can expect over what I call the silly side, the demonstrations, um, I don't know if Chelsea saw it, but in Kansas City, PETA showed up with a nude wrapped in saran wrap laid out like a meat tray. Uh, guys, that's nothing but silly. 
Um, I mean, that's on the range of really silly. Uh, they run ads that I would say are at best false, um, but clearly sil silly. Their picketing can get serious, they, depending on where they are and how it's done. You can get rock throwing, et cetera. Uh, but I would say the serious, what you can expect, sabotage, particularly if you're housing animals and they can get access to the food or water of those animals. Uh, fairs, exhibitions, I think, are particularly vulnerable to outsider sabotage. Destruction of your animals. Uh, the traffic stops, that's pretty serious. Um, litigation, I don't know how much it's going to cost uh, the calf owner to get his cows back, but lawyers don't work cheap. And you can bring on all the jokes you want about it, but we've got law school debts and et cetera that we have to pay off. Not, I got mine paid off finally after I went on the bench. Uh, regulation and legislation, none of that comes cheap, none of it's simple. So. We have the, the debate. I take this debate in, as being serious because I would suggest to you that as we bring the forces of the public health people who want safe food, we have constitutional rights, hopefully we have animal science, we have a bureaucracy out here, the fate of animal agriculture lies somewhere in the crux of this debate. Are we going to have animal agriculture in 50 years in this country? I don't know. So the basic debates you'll hear, and I'm just going to go through them quickly. What should the animal-human relationship be? Is it speciesism to deny animals basic human rights? You'll find that the activists are very much opposed to the auctions and livestock sales because they equate it to the speciesism of slave auctions. And they, are, they want to shut down. They will tell you, I've had them tell me, she intends to see the Shipshawana auction in Indiana shut down because it's speciesist. I can hardly say the word. Should we eat meat for our protein? and other nutrients. Should we produce animals for research or should we stop all medical research if a computer doesn't do it? Um, and who should make these determinations? Answering the question of who should make these determinations will determine the size of the voice agriculture and animal agriculture have in the debates. What would be the outcome if animals had rights? And I don't like this. The Bramble Report, by setting out the five freedoms as rights, was horribly misguided. It should have been owner responsibilities. Responsible owners are going to feed and water their animals. And it should have been framed as owner responsibilities, not rights. Who's going to pay for all this care? Who's going to serve as the guardian ad litem? Do you want, and we're actually seeing proposals, to have special animal law courts. Um, I equate it to like the drug court. Um, so put these questions on hold through the rest of the morning, because I think more discussion is needed to really develop how animal agriculture is going to, response to respond to these questions. So we have a range of views on what animal law should be. And we have up in the corner owner responsibility. And I think I would guess everybody in this room agrees that owners have the responsibility to care for the animals they own as appropriate to the breed and species. I don't think that's debatable. I think we go to animal well-being and I think we agree to the standard of no cruelty. And I would suggest care that improves the animal's viability or improves the animal's status if it has a temporary pain is not cruelty if it's managed correctly. Cruelty is more permanent painful damage. And, and that's a discussion we all need to have on how appropriate care techniques may hurt 
but they're not cruelty. I was not cruel to my daughter when I took her in every single day after she was born for a blood count because she had a, a problem at birth. She didn't like having her heel stuck for the blood count, and she cried, but that was not cruelty, even though she suffered pain. And I would suggest we have to help people understand the difference between cruelty and pain that is, I think, a legitimate pain, to the point where we treat animals as humans, and that's the animal rights perspective. The difference, I think, is important. Animal welfare, the owners have the responsibility to determine care and use. Owners have the responsibility to provide appropriate care for the species and breeds. And owners have the responsibility not to abuse nor neglect. But personhood for animals is like treating the animal as a child that's never going to grow up. Animals are never going to grow into adults and have the independent ability to determine their circumstances and make decisions that require judgment. Basically, animal rights is adapting the concept of children in need of services to apply to animals. And the animal rights groups want to be named as their guardians. Rebecca Huss in Indiana petitioned the court and was named as the guardian ad litem for Michael Vick's dogs. You all know that story. But the point is, they not only want to set the standards for the care, they want to be the guardian ad litems to make the owners provide those standards of care, regardless of cost or, I would even say, common sense. Legally, we're going to zip through this, Animals are property, animals are property. We adopted the common law in all but three states. And that, the common law as adopted in this country, is that animals are property. And the question of the day is, are we letting the romance with rights overwhelm the common sense approach of property, ownership, responsibility? It's almost like the romance of animal rights is overwhelming the common sense of animal, response, animal ownership responsibility. And you might want to ask, why are we shifting the arguments to food safety? So in all states, regardless of whether they adopted the common law or not, at this time, animals are property except for wild animals and feral animals. No state has really adopted animal rights as a statewide code approach. We're still at, ostensibly, owner responsibilities. So those ownership rights and responsibilities are established by the state. Um, we see increasing pressure to have the federal government preempt state law. I have, uh, I think we have to have some serious discussions about the Tenth Amendment and do you really want to do that? Um, I don't think federal regulation of animal ownership is defensible by virtue of the Tenth Amendment unless the animal's involved in interstate commerce. So what happens when the constitutional rights collide? Your advocates, your activists have First Amendment rights. They can do almost anything but shout fire in a crowded room. I'm not sure this room is crowded enough to prevent them from shouting fire. But um, anyway, but the owners have rights too. They have the right to have proper notice before their property is seized. They have the right to have security in their home and not be invaded by activists. Uh, private labs, university labs are deemed as private property and they should be secure for the welfare of the animals and the people who work there. So we have this real collision here of constitutional rights. So Section 8, that does give the, of the Constitution, Congress regulates interstate commerce. We got that. Tenth Amendment, though, and if you haven't read it, I suggest you do it in needlepoint or hang it on your wall somewhere because it's so important and it's so seldom read. 
But the Tenth Amendment clearly says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. That Tenth Amendment is ignored a lot in this whole discussion and it's time to, I think, dust the cobwebs off and start talking about what is appropriate, what is the responsible approach to animal welfare. My cows in Indiana, I'm going to take care of them. But I'm going to take care of them differently probably than somebody who has cows in Alaska or Montana. We have climate difference, terrain differences, the whole layout of how we work is different. So we have the state constitutions. Every single state constitution in this country guarantees some rights of property ownerships. Watch for the amendments to the state constitutions. They're quite dangerous. So who has which constitutional rights? Does the owner or does the activist? And I would suggest to you they both have constitutional rights and we're going to have to figure out how to hold safe the rights of each one of them. It isn't easy and it's going to require people like you sitting at the table and I don't care if you have to arm wrestle to get it in the discussion. It needs to be done. The U.S. Bill of Rights, the, the amendments, um, just in case you don't know why I think they're important, First Amendment's freedom of speech. There are some issues around the First Amendment for owners as well and their exercise of religious beliefs and the preparation of food for religious beliefs. Uh, Fourth Amendment is the right against unreasonable searches and seizures. I want to see the order from the court granting the warrant, the search warrant, to see my animals before I'm going to let you on my ground. I want to see the description of my animals that you are authorized to search. Most farmers don't know that they can do this, but they're going to. Fifth Amendment, again, you cannot be deprived of your property without due process of law. Due process of law. At this point in time, my DeKalb County cap owner has had no criminal charges for animal abuse and neglect filed against him. His animals were taken without court order and without any follow-up action. He is going to have to file the lawsuit to get his calves back. That is a violation of his Fifth Amendment because his property was taken without due process. Sixth Amendment, they told him they were going to file criminal charges because it was abusive to have 14 calves in that trailer. Um, they haven't filed them. And I don't think they're going to because at least the prosecutor doesn't intend to file them. And in Indiana, only the prosecutor can file criminal charges. Seventh Amendment, a trial by jury is guaranteed. I don't think a lot of juries are going to find that there was any reason to seize those calves. The Ninth Amendment is kind of the wonderful kitchen sink amendment. Um, I really like it because it says it is not to disparage or deny other rights retained by all of us just because all of those rights are not mentioned in the Constitution. I'm not going to dwell on this because Chelsea did a good job of, of kind of folding in that loop, but we have over 50 federal laws altogether around animal uh, protection. Why I am concerned about the laws and the seizures, think about the burden on a justice system that is reeling from the, and you can take your choice, heroin outbreak, opioid epidemic, meth epidemic, whatever the drug of choice is in your state and community, your courts are overwhelmed with it. They're trying to figure out how to deal with the caseload they have. For the animal rights activists to bring frivolous lawsuits is abusive on every single taxpayer in the jurisdiction where they bring them. Right now, if you want to get a divorce 
and get your life settled and get on the way, you're not going to get a hearing date in most courts in less than one to two years. Less than 5% of the criminal cases in Indiana, now this is Indiana, this one, go to trial. Everything else is pled off. Why? We don't have enough courtrooms and judges. Um, if you look at the national picture, take a look at the data at the National Center for State Courts. They'll tell you almost every single state cannot meet the guidelines for prompt and speedy trials. And if you would, the most recent data they have is 2008. The current, the cost in 2008 of the state and local court justice systems was a billion dollars. How much do you want to spend on building justice systems to handle the frivolous and silly animal rights claims? Um, again, I said I was going to flip through here. Knowing the law is half the battle when they do show up. You need to know the legal issues for dealing with animal rights activists at whatever your facility is. What is your ownership? Are you public or private? That's going to make a big difference. And you need to assess the danger for your people and your animals both at your facility and away. I never thought that my animals would be in danger on a public highway, but I am wrong. I understand that some of you may know or have had contact with the animal angels. Apparently, they're following livestock haulers and trying to intimidate them. Oops. So, here's the answer. And I love quoting uh, General Eisenhower. Plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And he gave this speech in 1957, and I would suggest to you that it still holds true. It's a beautiful piece of logic about planning. And the bottom line is if you are, have not been planning, you can't start to work, at least intelligently. You have to be planning on how to deal with the activists before you can start dealing with them if you're going to do it in an intelligent way. So. For me, the meat of what I have to say it may seem really simple to you, but you and your organization and your constituents need to plan to plan. You need to figure out what resources you need to do the planning process and identify your issues that you need to address in your plan. Where do you have human safety concerns? Where do you have animal safety concerns? Where do you have public relations concerns? Identify your issues as part of your overall planning um, process and make sure you figure out who the people are that are actually going to respond to each piece of those issues because those responders need to be in the plan. You can't have top brass sitting up here handing down plans unless you have the people that are actually going to be responding involved. And write your plan to address both the issue and the level of protest or level of exposure you have. That's the first step. Then education. Um, identifying the audience. Are you someone who has the public in your premises? You need to think about how you're going to educate your public that visit you for whatever reason. And then you need to make sure that you create and deliver the materials to do that. So this diagram is a starting point. I would suggest that each organization that deals with animal agriculture really needs to identify the partners you are working with. If you think the animal rights people don't have a network, think again. They have a very well-developed network. They have very quick communication with each other. Some of us, not so much. How many of you have talked to the Department of Homeland Security? Okay. Agriculture is a vulnerable area for terrorists and activists. And Department of Homeland Security has identified that. And they, have, they are working uh, on plans to deal with it. 
animal agriculture should be involved in that planning process because whether the person is an activist or a terrorist may not make a whole lot of difference when at your facility you have a fire, an explosion, a poisoning, or whatever. So Department of Homeland Security should be, if you haven't been to their webpage, at least go to their webpage and look at the areas of information about agriculture. Law enforcement. Law enforcement is huge because the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and folks, back in the 90s, I was the judicial outreach liaison to teach the Indiana judges about CDLs, how things have changed, because now they want to not give ag exemptions to a number of the Federal Motor Carrier uh, Administration regulations. And the ones that they are willing to give right now are mostly to benefit people hauling crops, not animals. So this is important. Law enforcement can make pretextual stops. And you say, well, an expired plate's not a pretextual stop. Well, it is if it's made with the intent to actually seize your animals and turn them over to a humane society. That's a pretextual stop. So we are working. Um, Protect the Harvest is working with a number of people to do law enforcement training. Why? Because the Humane Society of the United States has signed a memorandum of understanding with the National Sheriff's Association, and they are doing training in your states, whether you know about it or not. Look on the National Sheriff's Association's website and see what they say about their memorandum of understanding with HSUS. It's real. They've received money for it. They trained, HSUS trained a number, 600 law enforcement officers in Oklahoma. The sheriff seized some animals. The court has ordered the sheriff to return those animals. The sheriff gave them to the Humane Society to keep. He can't find all those animals and he's now been cited for contempt because the court ordered him to return the animals he seized improperly. Animal health. I'm so blessed to be from Indiana. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I like Ohio and Illinois, and you guys from Michigan, you're nice neighbors too, and Kentucky. But we are really blessed to have a board of animal health that understands protecting animal well-being means including law enforcement in the training. And so we're doing that. Um, also, if you are involved with fairs, shows, exhibitions, really need to get them involved with your planning process. So you have a continuous loop planning cycle. You really need to say, planning is a part of our everyday life. We're going to do it, and we're going to keep doing it right. We're going to keep current. And I would suggest you have an annual review, and review the 30 to 60 days before you have an event or a date that has some meaning, uh, depending on how you're involved uh, with animals.